Since we opened our recycling center in 1991, we've received over 700,000 tons of materials from Oneida and Herkimer County to process and be made into materials. We charge a tipping fee for non-recyclable garbage here of $72.15 per ton. That $72.15 pays for all our programs and operations here in Oneida and Herkimer counties. It pays for the Household Hazardous Waste Collection Program. It pays for our Public Education Program. It pays for future programs that we intend to do here at future facilities. So the only source of revenue we have is our tipping fee to pay for all our programs. Any recyclable material can be delivered here at zero or at no charge. The more recyclable material they can put in the orange bin means less material they have to put in the blue bag and excessively less blue bags they're going to have to buy. One thing I want to make sure is that the residents only give us material that can be recycled. We're still getting toys and Barbie dolls and Lego blocks and things like that. People think that all plastics recycle, but it's not. The only thing we can recycle has a number. Recycling education is a very important part of solid waste management. We here at the Authority feel that recycling education is so important that we actually have a full-time school recycling coordinator that works with the schools in Oneida and Herkimer County providing recycling education to the students, teachers, maintenance people, and the administration. We put a lot of emphasis on our school recycling program. We work, we've developed green teams within the schools and we encourage schools to continue to recycle because basically schools are, are paper factories. The most material they make is paper and they have a high quality material that can be recycled. So we want to make sure that they separate that material, get it out of the waste stream and get it properly recycled. Okay. Our United Village is started as a result of some neighbors working together in their community and making a really big difference. So back in the mid-90s uh, here in Portland, there were some really huge issues in the, in the neighborhood. Historically, in the community, neighbors had tried to address those problems by calling 911. When the police had a heavy presence in the area, some of the issues would calm down, or at least seem like they'd calm down. But as soon as the police moved on to another hot spot, some of the problems would resurface. I'm gonna figure out what it would take to start a nonprofit that would focus on this. And I started interviewing other nonprofits. I ended up interviewing over 20 nonprofits. All of them had the same number one top barrier, and that was funding. <laughs> Everybody said, you know, it was kind of like a sugar high. When the funding was there, it was go, go, go. But as soon as the money went away or the funding source went away, um, it often came down for a crash. What if we started our own funding source? What if we were 100% self-sustained? And looking at models that, that worked. So we started, our United Villages started this project called the Rebuilding Center. And the Rebuilding Center really was a 
perfect example of what our United Villages was promoting, and that is that every single person, everybody can make a positive difference in the world or in their community um, by just changing the way they do things. So a great example are these building materials. If you go through the Rebuilding Center, you're going to find everything from the components uh, that make up an, a home or a building from a doorknob to the entire structure of a building. 90% of what the Rebuilding Center was accepting back when we started in 1998 was what society was throwing away. They basically were paying money to haul these materials off from this community and throw them in the garbage and either burn them or landfill them and treat them as waste. And by simply not throwing them out, by saying, uh, let's donate them and get them reused and find a new home for them, it has a completely different outcome. And so those materials now raise millions of dollars in the local community. Same materials. I think that's the part that's mo one of the most exciting parts. We're, uh, one of the largest uh, thrift store for building supplies in North America. Um, we run about eight tons of reusable building uh, materials through a day. We focus on providing living wage jobs, keeping materials out of the landfill, and then doing community support uh, work through our outreach department. We also deconstruct houses, which means dismantling houses by hand. A lot of the most beautiful wood available is, is in these structures, not in the forests that have been, that are no longer with us. So we find beautiful uh, lumber from our deconstruction crews. Instead of crunching it and sending it to the landfill, people are making furniture out of it. And also getting a good feeling out of it because it feels good to reuse wood. It helps a lot of small nonprofits that are uh, starting out and serving the community with the variety of lumber. If you use reused materials and cost effective through a thrift store environment, you, sh you could certainly make your dollars stretch farther and, and provide more, more services. For the people to be present, we must give consideration to the environment, but you cannot focus just on the environment without focusing on the people. It's all about building the capacity for that positive social change, being a catalyst, consulting for free, and convening, hosting free events for the community. Funding, our funding stream, comes solely from our project, the Rebuilding Center. We can give anyone assistance in what we've encountered and what has worked for us and what pitfalls we fell into and help other organizations to learn from our mistakes and also from what we feel is doing well for us. And we're always willing to share information with people, both through our outreach department, through the store, through any part of the organization. So we can certainly be contacted. I mean, you'll, you'll have to find the people and do the work, definitely. It's, you know, like they say, if it, was, if it was easy, everyone would do it. And anything that this organization can do to assist someone to start this in any locality, in any community, we'd certainly love to assist in any way we can. Groundwork Portland focuses on working with kind of engaging low-income communities of color in reclaiming properties, in particular vacant or contaminated properties in their neighborhoods, and converting them into community spaces such as gardens, green space, parks, or multi-use sites to benefit the community. Our first pilot project is the Emerson Street Garden. It's based in Northeast Portland. This garden is trying to bring people together across ethnic groups and across age differences. This is on a site where there was lead contamination and it's very standard contamination. So it's from a house that used to be on the site. The lead paint fell to the ground and it's concentrated. So we've been working on building awareness about how to clean up the lead in a sustainable way. So we're piloting this new way of cleaning and doing phytoremediation using plants that uptake the lead and doing ongoing research on site, engaging youth in the learning process as well as you know, the broader community. It's really creating community in a neighborhood where there has been a lot of very rapid change and a lot of distrust. So what we're trying to do, in addition to just create a garden and clean up a site, is to have ongoing dialogue, that ongoing presence and sort of um, folks being watchful and caring about the space 
creates a safer environment. Since I used to live here, you know, back in 1977 mm -hmm. until 1982, mm -hmm. so I said, well, you know, sometimes, you know, I'm retired and I want to kind of give back to the community. So, and I live in a neighborhood. Right. So this was uh, just a good challenge. Well, right now I'm just basically growing uh, fall and winter stuff, you know, kale and cabbage. Another thing I like about the program is we all can learn from each other. Mm -hmm. You know, it's always a diver diversity here. We opened up about two and a half years ago. This place was a mess when we bought it, huh. but because it was a mess, we were able to get it for very cheap. We didn't have very much money, so we spent four or five years working on it through our hard labor, and eventually it paid off. When I started the project, Varick Street wasn't quite what it is now. It was sort of up and coming. You could feel a little bit of the atmosphere kind of changing. So mm -hmm. when I saw this building available, vacant, all boarded up windows, I said, why not? This house was actually scheduled for demolition. It would have been demolished in a couple of months if I didn't buy it. And there were two houses next to it that were on the same list and they have actually been demolished since then. Most people in Utica, we haven't had a lot of population loss and they look back at how things were before. Um, I think that's one of the biggest problems here. People need to look not how things were, but how things can be in the future. They have to you know, think about a new way of Utica being, not the old way. And until they can break that cycle of thinking what it was like before, it's going to continue to be hindered. If you go to most cities that are thriving, there are so many little pocket neighborhoods. And you're starting to see that happen in Utica. You have the Barrack Street area, you have the Uptown Theater, the district over there, there's like a new bar and there's a coffee shop, and then there's a development happening over on Bleecker Street. And if you can get these small little neighborhoods to start to form in the city, then you start to see people taking pride in their neighborhoods again, because there's unique identities inside of the city. The thing about Utica was that real estate is very cheap, labor is very cheap, so if you're willing to work hard by yourself, it doesn't take a lot to get a business open. The business has to be a viable business and you have to do your research and figure out if it'll work or not, but if you're willing to use your elbow grease and yeah. get behind the project yourself, you can make anything happen with not much capital here. Mm -hmm. Reusing is the best form of recycling that there is. So if you could take an old building that was scheduled to be demolished I mean, to have a building made out of brick, to have that built today would be nearly impossible. It needed a lot, when I say needed a lot of work, I mean, there was a lot of work involved. It took, you know, five years to get this place open. Mm -hmm. But now that it is, I mean, I look at it and it's beautiful. I mean, it just has the old historic character to it, and it, since it's been replaced now, it's, uh, it's reused. When you walked in the building when I first bought it, you could only see the fireplace tile now. That's the only thing that is the same. I took the Latin plaster off of the brick, it was originally two apartments. I mean, there's been a lot of change here, mm -hmm. but the space itself, I mean, that, that's, that's what really matters. But I've still got a bunch of lumber that I plan to do something with eventually. It's beautiful, old, like thick, rough cut lumber that was all inside the walls, and it's just sitting in a pile right now. Eventually, yeah. I'm gonna use it for something, but I'm definitely not gonna waste that material. Utica was a, a very easy place to make something happen because there's so many abandoned buildings that are just waiting uh, to have life put back in them. One thing that I'd personally like to see more of is to do a project like this. When I bought the building, I was 23 years old and I was just full of it, mm -hmm. you know? So that's a project that a young person should be willing to take on. And that's the time in your life when you should be doing it. So right. we get more young people in this area to develop a project in their mind and then put it on paper and then start the project and complete it. The area would be thriving, I believe. When I went to college, I learned more in my first two weeks on the job than I did all four years of my college so to get the hands-on experience and actually build a business and, and work on the business plan and building the business itself that is just experience that uh, is invaluable and if, and if a local college were to do something like that if i had a child in college i would push them towards that program myself <laughs>
someone could buy their own sound. This one here, this this Squire Strat, Squire, you know, it's like everyone's like, oh, Squire, that's garbage. I could refret this thing, I put new pickups in, I could oil the neck up, and this thing will sound a lot better than that thing. No one's going to have anything like it. I think in this modern age, it's kind of a lost art to know how to manage finances, but at the same time, it's becoming more and more important. It seems like everything is being greenwashed these days, and people don't realize the value of recycling what they already own, rather than buying new. People enjoy buying new things, and they enjoy the slight uptick in status that new things offer to them. And so when your friend does it, you'll be more likely to do it, and so on, and so on, and so on, until the new standard is to have a car that was made within the past two or three years. And so that expectation within social groups, large or small, continues to rise. I think marketing drives quite a bit of it. Marketers know how to tap into those insecurities or issues with identity or desire and exploit them so that in the absence of a need, an artificial need is created. I think you can do as well with what you already have or what someone else has owned previously in almost every category of consumer life, short of personal hygiene and food. I really think that there's enough stuff in the cycle for people to just tap into that cycle if they know how to do it and with a little advanced planning and, and to take some of the stigma away from it. I think it's completely acceptable and probably slightly more forward thinking for people to start to buy used clothing, used shoes, used cars, etc., etc., in every arena of their lives. It would certainly offer them more control over their finances and it would reduce the demand. What happens when you've used up all the stuff? Like, to buy used essentially depends on someone down the chain buying new. Right. How do you respond to that? I don't think we'll ever reach a point in this country where there aren't new things being produced. There will always be a segment of the market that supports that. And I would argue that point that the quantity of used items, good used items that are out there is almost inexhaustible. And it kind of calls for not, not a complete suspension of production of everything under the sun, but a smarter production. A production that's more in line with actual human needs rather than manufactured desire. Sharing not only helps reduce our consumption and use what we have more efficiently, it promotes relationships and trust among people. Libraries, for example, are a wonderful way for communities to share books, but what about extending that idea beyond book sharing? What if libraries shared tools in addition to books? In fact, how much less of everything would we need to buy if we just shared more? Let's take a look at a simple example of how we can reduce our consumption of energy and build a stronger social network at the same time. A favorite pastime for many people is watching TV. But do we all have to watch TV alone? Let's consider only the energy used by the light bulb and television in each room. For simplicity's sake, we'll assume that everyone here has a 100 watt light bulb and a TV that uses around 120 watts. By watching TV at home alone, each person uses 220 watts of electricity themselves. Multiply that by nine people and you've got a situation that requires 1,980 watts. Let's see what happens when people start sharing their TV time together. When the TV goes off and the party really gets started, each person only uses 11 watts of power. Compare that to the 220 watts each person needed to stay home alone. 
and we've only scratched the surface. Home heating and cooling, for example, use a lot more energy than our TVs and lights. Wouldn't you rather depend more on your friends and less on your electric bill? Brothers Osowski, you kids are in a heap of trouble. Do you know what we do to kids around here who don't pay attention in class, cut school, go to Portland to make movies? up yet.